Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, we, we are starting uh, 15 minutes late. Um, in two seconds, it will be exactly 15 minutes late. Uh, Teddy was just saying to me if it was Mexican time, it would be 30 minutes late. Uh, but actually, if it's American time, I think we're like 50 years late to what we're going to talk about tonight. We are basically 50 years late. So if it feels like 15 minutes, you, you missed out on 50 years, just went by uh, in this room. I know, by the way, the students who are in the school feel like somehow 50 years goes by uh, in one year. But it's a sort of a celebration. But I'm serious about the fact that what we will end up talking about tonight uh, is something that has been uh, so, so systematically and easily forgotten uh, in schools of architecture. So I'm sort of super interested in uh, what might be uh, resonating uh, today with things that were very strong uh, more or less half a century ago and try to understand why we might be in the middle of some kind of uh, rhythm more at the scale of the planet or of society by which certain things are coming back uh, uh, to hit us. The excuse for this kind of heavy discussion of what it is that we have forgotten for 50 years and now uh, comes back is a, is a celebration, is a, is a party, um, and uh, we shall uh, have a party. A kind of a triple celebration. I think it is uh, firstly to uh, celebrate the extraordinary uh, Percival and Naomi Goodman uh, fellowship that has been so uh, generously sponsored by Ray Lachey. Ray, Ray is a victim of the school. Uh, his wounds are still healing uh, since 1947, 1957 when he graduated. Uh, for truth and advertising, I was born in 1956, so my sort of physical technology uh, somehow has the same uh, time scale as Ray's intellectual uh, technology. Uh, I, I, I was talking with him today, and he's of course younger than, 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 than I am, and, and, but he's given a new youth to the school by supporting this amazing uh, uh, project by which our students uh, uh, compete for the attention to, to have a project engaging with uh, key issues of, of uh, social justice uh, around the world. And there's a very tough jury that evaluates the work and they were doing their work uh, today and I'm enormously grateful uh, to, 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 the, to the jury for doing this work. And, and as I was explaining to Ray earlier today, it's not only just a wonderful thing that, that the timing of the arrival of this uh, 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 award which, which exactly treasures uh, a particular kind of attention uh, to the responsibility of the architect, uh, uh, not just socially, ec economically, uh, not just ethically, but certainly uh, somehow uh, uh, globally. Uh, I, I think it could be argued that, um, that the United States um, uh, and Western Europe will play zero role in the future of cities, uh, it would be my uh, suggestion. Um, we are uh, bystanders in the enormous experiment that's underway by which um, 9.3 billion people will occupy the planet and more than 70% of those people will be living in cities and we really are not even ready to think about that. Just to give you a sense, 2 billion of those people will be living in cities, will be over the age of 60. So whatever it is, the city of the future, it's a city for uh, uh, people that are not uh, young according to classical uh, definitions. That is to say, and when you get older, you need actually a little bit more architecture. Architecture is replacing the resilience of your young body. So this means actually the role of the architect will go up, not just because there are more people, but they are going to be demanding more architecture. Whatever that city of the future is, it's a very different kind of city, and you could argue that our cities today are entirely age segregated, that cities are designed for production, and whatever comes before education, whatever comes after retirement, is outside of the uh, production of the city itself. This, this will not be possible in uh, 2050. So again, uh, I'm returning endlessly to the question of age. I don't know if that's because the speaker tonight is in the last day of his 40s, um, and it's almost, it's almost all over um, for, uh, uh, for him. But, but in, that, in, that, in that moment that uh, he leaves the 40s behind, it, you see it's the same rhythm, it's the same uh, uh, time period. And of course the, 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 the celebration of, uh, of Percy Goodman is a celebration exactly of certain things that were very, very uh, uh, important in that earlier moment. Percival Goodman, uh, whose life was from 1904 to I think 1989, was an astonishing uh, urban theorist 
and, and, and architecture, and architect, and I'm embarrassed if I have to explain to you these things, or you should be embarrassed if I have to explain to you these things. I give you some clues so you can go to the website. This is a phenomenal guy. This is like a phenomenal synagogue designer. I think he has the world record for the number of synagogues. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing uh, person, an amazing, amazing uh, teacher. Uh, somebody who's, who's known around the world, uh, uh, especially outside of the world of architecture, for the book he wrote with his brother Paul in 1947, uh, Communitas, which considers the possible, possible futures for society and makes the strongest possible case uh, uh, for an open, free society in the language that we would use uh, uh, today. But so important to understand that that social vision is born from being an architect, is born from those synagogue projects, from those classrooms and from those... Uh, students, that somehow one building has in it the possibility of capturing uh, not only the people that are in it, but the society uh, uh, in, in, in general. He was 25 years teaching in this uh, building. Uh, that's, there are many, many victims if you are here for 25 uh, uh, years, but, but basically it means tw for 25 years the people were very, very lucky. And I think the reason that, that Ray has been so kind and so generous in this regard is it's also a gift uh, literally to, to Percy himself to, to remember the fact of this astonishing uh, uh, moment that Ray was lucky enough to be a student of, of Percival Goodman uh, here. Uh, it's super unlikely that any of the teachers teaching in the school today will be remembered that way. I mean, these, these are, you have to really bear in mind that schools uh, have over their long history one or two people uh, that make a difference. I apologize uh, to you teachers in the room. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you do some homework about Percival Goodman, you'll know what I mean. Like, it's just don't even bother. Just don't even uh, 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 go there. So then I th you know, then after five years of this, and, and, and I, it's, it's so, so directly uh, connects to the new generation of students for whom all of those issues are deeply, deeply uh, relevant. This is, a, this is a generation that absolutely refuses to compromise and believes that social justice and sort of technological brilliance and uh, uh, being beautiful personally and in your buildings and so on, all of this is part of the same, uh, uh, to be incredibly tender and caring about your local situation, starting with your family and, and working out, but also to have some sort of global uh, uh, capacity. For the students of today, this is, the base, this is like default setting, this is the beginning. No, none of that was a decision, that's just minimum uh, uh, standing. So I think to, 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 to honor Percival in this way and to honor it by empowering the students whose work is in, is in the, he, that he would have admired, I think is absolutely right. So I thought we should go one step further and try to have something like tonight, uh, uh, you know, an annual Percival and Naomi Goodman uh, lecture, which even brings a little bit uh, more to the public, uh, this kind of new, new uh, uh, thinking or this fact that the school woke up after 50 years is, I guess, what I'm trying to... Uh, say in that kind of Rumpelstiltskin uh, kind of way, which doesn't mean that the entire school has become a kind of NGO, but I could show you enough images to suggest that that's exactly what it is, right? That the school is in some ways operating in a way that you would normally understand as, a, uh, as an NGO. So again, who, now here's the difficult part, who do you have as the first speaker who not only has to sort of look vaguely good in the shadow of first of all Goodman, but more than that, actually somehow capture in the world what it is that the students are tuning into and, and are changing the inside of the school. And I think there just really is no one better than uh, uh, Teddy for this. Uh, born, I think, in Guatemala City. I'm not sure. Is it? Yeah? yeah? yeah from Guatemala. I, I don't know. He has founded a number of studios, I think, in 93 or something like that. So that's more or less 10 years of this uh, studio. He's an architect. He's an artist. He's a teacher. He's for sure... Uh, an activist. I don't think he really cares about these words very much. Maybe he cares about the activist word. Uh, he's had a very, uh, I think, strong impact on, on architects because, again, going back to the uh, uh, Percival Goodman, Percival Goodman was, was trained in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts as a result of winning the prize here in 1925. That is to say, he was in Paris in that school in exactly the years that uh, modern architecture was, was going from a kind of uh, agitation uh, to, to a kind of a, a global uh, statement. And then 20 or 22 or so years ago comes this very strong statement about what a new society could be and how one connects the new society with the dreams of the architect. This is the uh, uh, basic uh, issue here. And I think Teddy is really operating in the, along those lines. 
to say it really very, very too quickly, ArcTX are really quite good on up and down and inside and out. Um, we've had 3,000 years working on that. We, we can really talk the talk and walk the walk on how to get in, how to get out, what it means to go up, what it means to go down. And certainly if you were in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, you could do drawings of what in and out and up and down mean. But basically, Teddy, of course, has forced everybody to think about north and south um, and make north and south more of a priority before you talk inside and outside, or maybe south is understood to be outside for one group and inside uh, uh, for another. This means, in a way, he's concentrating on a kind of, uh, I think, uh, as he would put it, political equator uh, between north and south, which is to do with resources, strategies, wealth, uh, power, uh, and so on. At this local level, you could say, between San Diego and Tijuana. And, and what, what Teddy does is just basically um, treat the border as a kind of uh, CSI uh, victim. And he explores every dimension of it, every piece of evidence from both sides of the border. He doesn't privilege one or the other. He observes very, very closely uh, uh, what happens. What I think is, is finally the reason that, that Teddy's, uh, uh, I'm going to try to make it impossible for you to give a lecture. Uh, a short, a short circuited way of saying why Teddy's important. I think he's, he's helped to redefine the responsibility of the architect, like what could be responsible work. Uh, but this is completely unlike when I was being trained as an, as an architect in New Zealand, where responsibility and creativity were understood to be absolutely uh, uh, opposite. Yes, responsibility is a decent word for understanding uh, 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 Teddy and his kind of call. Uh, but really, it's just a microsecond later, responsibility is an agitation towards creativity. So what you will see in the work is a great love of design and its uh, 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 potentials. And in as much as this school is an experimental laboratory for new forms of creativity, I think it's just great to think of responsibility as demanding from us uh, the highest possible levels of creativity. So couldn't be a better guy. Um, listen to him well, because were, were he to give a lecture to you tomorrow, he wouldn't be in his 40s anymore. Um, you would like him, you would treasure him like an early iPad. He'd, you'd be fond of him, but you wouldn't be listening anymore. So listen carefully, uh, Teddy Cruz. Wow. Mark, thank you so much for that introduction. That's fantastic. Th thank you so much for inviting me to come back to Columbia, but this is a special occasion of for sure it's an incredible privilege to give this inaugural Percival and Naomi Goodman lecture. So I think it's an appropriate uh, moment to do a kind of summary of some of the issues uh, that have compelled me to rethink the role of an architect, particularly in this moment of, of crisis, and, and really the world that is located in a very particular geography of conflict. So I think in a sense I want to share a variety of issues that have been essential to this questioning of the protocols themselves. Uh, that really enable architects to really touch on many other domains that have been peripheral to, our, uh, to design. And of course, in the context of the lecture series where we were asked to uh, propose a kind of where, what, where, who type of proposition, I begin by uh, the question simply that has been fundamental in our time, where is our collective imagination? So I will pick it up from where I left the last time when I was here at Columbia University in one uh, symposium on the injured city. And, uh, began with uh, reflecting. I think that no conversation can begin at this moment without really critically reflecting the moment that they occupy. Uh, and I found this, uh, uh, these two lines that are fundamental that really caught my attention. Uh, some of the most dramatic, maybe the two most dramatic lines I've seen recently uh, constructed in a, in a graph. And I wanted to begin again with that. Uh, in a sense, I've been interested in understanding where we are. I'm not from the United States, but really, uh, you know, I cannot claim anymore being a foreigner. I'm, I've been here 30 years. Uh, but nevertheless, it's interesting to really retroactively begin to piece together uh, the conditions that really have brought us here. What, what produced the crisis in the first place? What are the conditions that produce the crisis become the material, I think, for design in our time? Uh, so I think these two lines, uh, which move across the uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century to today in this graph are fundamental in this uh, opening up of the issues in simple terms. I'm interested in how complexity can be accessible uh, here. Yes, it's been said that the, we occupy the worst recession since the Great Depression. Every politician opens up a statement in such way. And I wanted to find out why that is. And of course, it's obvious uh, that the Great Depression and today are similar because they, in fact, uh, enabled, in a sense, these two lines. On the top, the largest income gap, uh, unprecedented concentration of economic power, 
uh, a thousand times more income uh, a, a concentrated in, a, in the upper echelons of society, but also supported by the lowest marginal tax uh, rates on the wealthy. Uh, what is interesting, though, is that we tend to dwell a lot on the uh, similarities between those two points, those dramatic points in history, but very seldom we open up a conversation that really opens up uh, the, what happened afterwards, after each of these points. And I began to really, in simple terms again, uh, understand that the true difference between then and today is that at least uh, after the Great Depression, to begin with, the banks were not uh, bailed out, and that prompted a, a fundamental reformation of the institutions. And not only that, uh, the possibility of really opening up uh, what I could call the political will of a society to re-engage a public imagination. In other words, uh, you would argue that while the economic power was concentrated, uh, the political power was still open. Uh, to enable that political will. What I'm trying to say is that what happened after the Great Depression, and I'm not a historian, but this is a very impressionistic uh, kind of diagram, uh, prompted the formation of the New Deal, uh, the Works Progress uh, Administration, unprecedented public spending to put Americans back to work, uh, the Second Bill of Rights. I mean, recently I found the Second Bill of Rights by FDR, and if you haven't read it, read it, read it again, please, because it contains some of the DNA that really needs to be recuperated. Uh, unprecedented investment in public infrastructure, uh, public uh, education, uh, and of course, a public housing. Public was not a forbidden word in the political language of this country. So you can see how that middle area of the graph really not only produced this sort of what I would uh, argue more equitable distribution of resources. We all know that after that, the graph begins to open up after 1982. We all know that after this moment, uh, the privatization of public resources, uh, free uh, market economics and policies begin to really transform the landscape that really has brought us to today. We can argue for a moment, if I can just be again impressionistic about it, between 1945, 1944, even 1930, late 30s to 1982, uh, let's say the 1% was more like 35% and the 99% was more like 65%. But of course, we all know that uh, after that period, after 82, the economy uh, inflates itself, again, out of the very logics that we already well, uh, know too well today. So the concentration of that economic power uh, is unprecedented uh, once more. The pendulum returns. 10% of uh, Americans own 50% of the income, 1%, 24% of the income, and so on. By, 19, uh, by 2008, we know that that uh, economy burst, and the illusion of the trickle-down economics really is uh, un unveiled, the kind of hypocrisy, I would say, the kind of false facade of this sort of idea. Only the United States, I think, ultimately, Poor people defend the rich, thinking that someday that wealth will trickle down to touch all of us. But this, that's falsehood. That falsehood is what really was, has revealed, obviously, in powerful ways today. So I called after 2008 in this sort of uh, a, a kind of, uh, I'm, I'm interested in very, again, impressionistic uh, 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 approximations to these uh, realities. There is just much more to say about it. But nevertheless, after 2008, I began to reflect on what I ended up calling the three slaps on the face of the American public, which I don't know why the obvious continues to stare us in the eyes, and yet we seem to be paralyzed and not know how to uh, organize or operate, uh, because it's been extremely obvious. First, the 99%, what we call it, uh, the American public in general, uh, came to the rescue of the very architects of the crisis in the shape of the Wall Street bailouts, first slap, and as we then uh, begin to uh, suggest that maybe there is a swap, okay, we, we bail you out, but at least uh, give us the guarantees to protect homeowners in this country, but without those guarantees, millions of foreclosures occur and continue occurring in this country that have prompted on, on unprecedented unemployment as well, second slap, and finally, out of the kind of euphoria of the kind of hijacking of the discourse by a minority in this country of right-wing sectors, uh, we have convinced the public somehow on the necessity of public spending cuts in unprecedented ways. The third slab. This is exactly the difference between the after the depression, the political will that really restores not only the kind of possibility of institutional reformation, but the political will again that enables a public imagination to really guide the conversation. The shrinking relevancy of the public is uh, what characterizes our politics today in this country primarily, but of course Europe and everywhere uh, suffers from the same deficit. 
while the 1% remains untouched. And I think that in this context, we can argue that what is also different about our time is not only that the economic power is concentrated in such ways, but this time also the political power that has put into motion an incredible lobbying machine that has in fact po a, a purchased public opinion and votes in this country. This is not just an environmental crisis. It is, and we must admit it, but I, I think primarily it's a cultural crisis, a crisis of the institutions. In a moment when we are paralyzed and not understanding how to reorganize ourselves as architects or as institutions in order to engage this unprecedented, again, transformation. So I would say again that what really faces us and what we are staring at once more, Harry Cobb, who is a friend of mine, once told me, what was different also when I told him this story that I was trying to compose through these simple diagrams, what was also different is that he said, I was 80 years old. Harry Cobb is definitely a lot older than I am. Uh, 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 I was 80 year, years old for the, in the Great Depression, and I still remember my father coming home when he lost his job, and I saw the parents of my classmates selling apples on the street. He says that the drama of this inequality hasn't really touched us yet. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing to remember, because in fact, even though we don't perceive it as such, it is inequality at the center of our discussion and our debate to face the unprecedented uh, inequality across uh, jurisdictions and communities. So in fact, a society that is anti-government ends up hurting the city. A society that is anti-taxes ends up hurting the city. A society that is anti-public ends up hurting the city. A society that is anti-immigration ends up hurting the city. And I think that this crisis is not from 2008. I recently visited, in fact, the neighborhoods of East Baltimore, where row after row of housing has been dilapidated for years already. Entire neighborhoods have been defunded of public infrastructure, of services, and in fact, in the uh, neighborhoods of North uh, Philadelphia, incredible depression that is not new, and I think we had not been paying attention uh, because we were somewhere else uh, in, in instigating somehow architectural creativity all the way to the demolitions recently in Cleveland that have prompted uh, a, a strange kind of mode of, uh, a, a, of renovation by the banking industry and just demolishing instead of uh, reactivating these foreclosed homes. This catastrophe has been designed, in fact, and I'm glad you mentioned the CSI situation because I think that it is, in fact, the possibility of a forensics of urbanization or an institutional forensics that can enable the understanding of what were, what were the protocols that produce, in fact, this crisis. How do we reorganize? And I think at this moment, I would argue for the need of detours. So as an architect, I've been realizing the need to take detours to contact the domains that have been peripheral to design, namely political and economic processes, just to return, hopefully, to architecture. This possibility that schools of architecture, but also in many other ways our profession, needs to open the space for other modalities of practice, that not all of us are interested in doing buildings, uh, but in fact uh, in engaging the sociopolitical processes in fact, I love what you said about this sort of gap that has been perpetuated between uh, social responsibility and artistic experimentation. I think it is that space of operation, what I mean needs to be activated again through the expanded uh, notions of practice. In fact, I've been saying this before, one of the most interesting uh, inspirations came not from an architect, a philosopher, or a writer, came from uh, General Petraeus, uh, in terms of this notion of expanded models of practice when he came back from his first tour in Iraq to give his report to Congress a few years ago, and I was blown away by what he said at that time, and read it in the New York Times, he said, the contemporary soldier, the first thing in his kind of listing of um, observations about the problem, the contemporary soldier needs to transform. And he said he or she cannot be anymore this uh, robot-like figure armed with every gadget, you know, and controlling the war at a distance. But in fact, the contemporary soldier, this is what blew my mind, must become a social worker, an anthropologist, and versed in many languages. And it was an interesting situation also because he said it's about engaging a, a more kind of rhizomatic and complex kind of relationships, social and familiar relationships on the street. So I began to imagine this is a, an interesting thing, uh, uh, that notions, uh, strange notions of the avant-garde suggest that exper artistic experimentation depend on a critical distance 
from the institutions when he, in fact, was arguing for a critical proximity. And it is, in fact, that critical proximity uh, that will begin to renegotiate a way of infiltrated into existing institutions. I wanted to recuperate those words because, in fact, it is a tragedy that the right-wing sectors uh, uh, across the board have begun to co-opt the very concepts that were forwarded already many years ago by the left in this country, whether intellectually and in many other ways, resiliency, resistance, uh, decentralization, self-organization, multiplicity, hybridity, all of that has been co-opted, in fact, has been instrumentalized by digitalized capitalism, isn't it? Well, in fact, it remains scones statically in our institutions, either as metaphorical representations or ultimately as academic uh, debates. So I'm thinking that now we weep because they stole our concepts because we, re we kept them metaphorically uh, static while they re um, transform it operationally. And I think it is the recuperation of these uh, concepts uh, uh, operationally what uh, engages us or re-engages uh, the, the artistic uh, creativity ultimately in the understanding of conflict. The visualization of conflict, geographies of conflict that are embedded in the territory. This is what brings me to in fact the, uh, the, the focus of my work which is a very specific locality of conflict which is the uh, Tijuana-San Diego border where my work has been located in the last years. Uh, and it's been import important to retroactively, again, observe uh, these environments. Not only the border itself as a line, which has been nevertheless emblematically a device, but I'm more interested in the tangential, invisible uh, forces inland uh, that begin to produce also not only the revelation, once more, that this is about a, an imposed jurisdictional boundary, but also that the border is elastic, of course, we all know this, and porous, and it is that invisibility of those transgressive uh, actions that really are important in, in my work. So uh, recently I, well, not recently anymore, but I uh, produced an exercise uh, of cutting a cross-section, 60 linear miles of transborder conflict. I decided a very, again, clear, direct exercise. I'm going to gather a series of moments uh, in the territory, 30 miles deep into Tijuana, 30 miles deep into San Diego, uh, to capture places where there is a collision of ecologies, whether the conflict of top-down forces of urbanization clashing with social or environmental networks uh, bottom up, uh, the radicalization of the local. And by radicalization, I'm glad that somebody mentioned that yesterday, is not a radical for the sake of radical, but it's about a really uh, engaging the roots of the problem. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the observation simply of the drama of these images for me has been essential. So 30 miles deep into San Diego, we can capture the conflict between top-down development and the topography as private developers are flattening the differential of the land in order to impose their cheap recipes of suburbanization in the shape of master plan gated communities. The conflict between large infrastructure and the watershed system as big, uh, huge, humongous free freeway infrastructure uh, goes along the coastal cities colliding with this natural hydrology, creating these strange environments uh, in, in the run. Conflict between gated communities and everyday life, the kind of upper side of uh, social life. The conflict between military bases and environmental zones, the only places where an otherwise continuous urbanization from Los Angeles all the way to Tijuana is interrupted is where the military bases are placed. So once more, this is a strange alliance between systems of urbanization, environmentalism, and militarization defining the future of the city. The conflict between, <clears throat> between formal and informal, which I will get to talk a little bit more, uh, further later, in the way that uh, many American neighborhoods are being retrofitted by immigrants. The conflict between two cities now arriving to the border border that collide, that ignore each other. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's really uh, baffling to really see these cities being so indifferent to each other uh, instead of, of course, negotiating their own future at this moment uh, together. The conflict between river and border so that the Colorado River enters into Tijuana and exits back into San Diego and the checkpoint is exactly at the juncture of the river and the border. Um, and the conflict between informal and natural ecologies because also the informal settlements 
the slums in Tijuana are placed and overlaid on top of these uh, environmental systems. The conflict between factories and emergency housing as factories have landed in Tijuana, making it one of those epicenters of cheap labor. The conflict between density and sprawl as Tijuana developers imitate the suburban recipes of uh, their counterparts in San Diego, but in miniature. The conflict finally, after miles and miles of traveling the Tijuana territory, the border wall itself sinks into the Pacific Ocean. I call this the mama of all conflicts, the conflicts between the natural and the political which I think is at the stake at this very moment, the rethinking of the jurisdictional through the pressing power of these natural and social systems. I juxtapose this horizon of local conflict on top of that dramatic image, uh, and of course, emblematic of this is the bookends of this cross-section. No other place in the world, I would argue, uh, brings together uh, some of the wealthiest real estate as the one found in the edges of San Diego, barely 20 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. And even though this dramatic gap or proximity between wealth or enclaves of wealth and circles of poverty is replicated even in New York City and beyond, it is amplified in, in unprecedented ways, I think, in this border. And this is a piece that we installed in the uh, US Pavilion in the Venice Biennale, uh, which for me was an amazing treat because it was six months before the Bush administration packed its bags. I, I had the opportunity to hang the border wall as a facade of the U.S. pavilion as the entrance into an exhibition dealing with the redefinition of practice in the conditions, again, of conflict. As a creative tool and the possibility, again, of exposing this crisis and uh, the conditions that produced it, because as we all know, as I mentioned, the, when, when globalization hits the ground, it materializes itself into these artifacts, this border wall, that transforms San Diego into the world's largest gated community. And it is, in fact, in the kind of compartmentalization and segregation and division of jurisdictions and communities out of this urbanization of fear and control what is at stake again once more in enabling different procedures to transgress it. And it is, in fact, this transgression of the border wall. As a friend of mine from Tijuana once said, Marcos Ramirez, you know, era artist, said the wall exists only to be transgressed. And isn't that the ultimate aspiration of art and architecture? The transgression of our own fears, our own preconceptions, our own cliches, uh, to enable, again, uh, other types of arrangements. Uh, so I'm interested, I've been interested in the, in the visualization, in the narrativization, if I can call it, of these transborder invisible informal flows that uh, transgress this formidable barrier. On one direction, the uh, impact of immigrants in the transformation of the American neighborhoods, uh, and on the other, the flow of waste from San Diego into Tijuana, these emblematic flows in the last years in my practice. Um, and of course, this is uh, captured a more uh, uh, as, as a kind of series of narratives more than a kind of precise analysis. Uh, nevertheless, embedded in these transactions, there is an interest in political economy that is really at the center of our work in, in, in the border. So, Tijuana import, uh, uh, imports the waste of San Diego in the shape of these post-war bungalows that in the last years have been uh, you know, exported into Tijuana. So as American developers are building an inflated version of levy towns, these smaller uh, post-war subdivisions has be, are being dismantled and these small houses travel to the border. So these are houses waiting to cross the border. And once they cross the border, they are put on top of these moment frames, uh, these steel frames, leaving the first floor to become the second, to be injected by other narratives, other uses. I call this a kind of club sandwich urbanization of sorts. It is a, a fearless approximation of opposites uh, that really uh, uh, compose the city. And of course, not only uh, houses of entire houses, but uh, all this debris, all this urban debris from one city to the next, we already know how they, uh, people in these uh, environments, in these informal settlements, use tires to construct retaining walls, but look at what they have now been able to develop out of a socioeconomic emergency. Uh, they have figured out how to peel off a tire, how to loop it, how to interlock it, and clip it into a more functional retaining wall. I mean, no. Uh, the fundamental theory that has emerged from urban, ur urbanism, how a unit becomes a system, can ultimately be uh, materialized here, uh, proving that in conditions of emergency, creativity flourishes. I do not want to f or glorify poverty. Nevertheless, living in these environments, I cannot avoid being seduced by this creative intelligence in the way that this waste 
is uh, reconceived and reorganized. Uh, the garage doors uh, that are uh, moved from uh, those older subdivisions and mass to Tijuana to construct social housing in these uh, environments, in these uh, informal settlements. But again, it's not the image of the informal what matters here. And this is, I wanted to say this, because of course the inf informality has come back to our field and to our debate, but unfortunately it has been trivialized as simply an aesthetic category, a kind of uh, formal or, or uh, uh, image. Uh, there is a process here that we need to really uh, reflect on. Uh, the levy towns uh, that have been dismantled in the last years are transferred 20 minutes south uh, to construct the new periphery of Tijuana. Levittown has been recycled, let's say, into Tijuana's informal settlements. There is an operative dimension of informality that is at stake here. So in this sort of layering and negotiations of boundaries, of resources, uh, uh, of exchanges, uh, again, with the topography, already we all know that there are a variety uh, of procedures. So again, it's not the aesthetic dimension of the informal, but in fact, amplifying the informal as a praxis that behind these negotiations and these procedures, there are a series, uh, again, of uh, hidden information that can be amplified, trans translated. And that has been one of the uh, tasks, I think, in our work, the translation of the informal into new, uh, what I can call models, political and economic. Another definition I would like to somehow, if I, I cannot call a definition about the informal, is that the informal, as a praxis, suggests the reorganization of imposed political and economic models. So in that sense, I think, embedded in these transactions is not just the images of a bricolage, but in fact, a, a political economy of waste. That these garage doors are sold, are transferred, are in, a, enabled by activists, are, are circulated. These systems uh, are part of an economy that is fundamental to these communities. So a, a series of concepts can be amplified uh, that would be difficult to really elaborate here. I just wanted to put a little bit of a series of um, a, um, concepts that I uh, many times uh, that escape because I run too quickly through these uh, issues. But, but one fundamental, again, aspect of this praxis of the informal is the political economy uh, of waste and the systems behind those. Uh, another one is the rethinking through the informal of the relationship of property and natural boundaries. Uh, some of our work in, in these uh, uh, environments, these informal settlements, begin to observe in our collaboration with uh, activists uh, within these environments uh, that the jurisdictional boundaries within the informal uh, imposed by land title agencies collide, of course, obviously, with the natural boundaries. And not only that is the story of these environments, but of our city in general. Uh, so I'm thinking how to rethink the very relationship of property, jurisdiction, and natural boundaries to begin thinking of these basins or these micro basins. In fact, many of these informal settlements are layered on these watershed systems. So that is an interesting uh, relationship. Can a micro basin be a way of uh, defining a neighborhood? And this has been a device that has, has been essential in uh, uh, enabling new political configurations in, within these uh, in protocols within these environments. Um, it, what I mean is, can a micro basin be a neighborhood, but also the, uh, enable a, a different political representation at the scale of that micro basin? Uh, this is something that is missing, I think, from the discourse at the moment, is the need to amplify other forms of governance at the scale of these localities that can, in, in fact, begin to reorganize those resources and present very different modalities, again, uh, of representation. Uh, another one is that, of course, uh, Tijuana, uh, in, in Tijuana we find a, a conflict. And, and, and in essence, I think what I'm trying to suggest is that many of our projects begin by simply naming the conflict and trying to then seek the authors or the actors or the institutions that are the stakeholders behind that conflict to begin a series of negotiations across uh, those environments. And in this case, the conflict that really caught our attention in Tijuana is the conflict between factories, labor, and housing. Because as you may know, many of these maquiladoras, these factories in Tijuana place themselves adjacent to slums so that they can borrow labor cheaply without investing in any infrastructure. So one aspect is, again, the rethinking of the sites of engagement. We wanted maybe to go to the slum as architects with our tools, 
but in fact, it is the factories where, in, uh, where the site of intervention in negotiating a very different relationship between material systems and social organization. So this labor um, that is borrowed from these environments works with these maquiladoras. The case study that we, will, we, be, we have been trying to elaborate is with a Spanish maquiladora called Mecalux that produces this lightweight um, uh, pallet system uh, that is exported all over the world from Tijuana. And we enter the space of the factory suggesting a very simple equation. You borrow labor from these slums. Can you give something in return? Uh, can some of these material systems and assembly lines really serve the purpose to be retrofitted lightly by architects to invent uh, systems of infrastructural, uh, uh, microinfrastructures to, 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 to stitch the waste in more uh, intelligent uh, ways, just like those rubber tires uh, uh, retaining walls? And can those be plugged into uh, the type of sweat equity or organizational uh, aspect within these environments? So it's this sort of uh, triangulation of systems that began to enable this first project, of, of course, understanding the factory as a site of intervention. And we began to produce a series of parts with the materials themselves of these maquiladoras, such as these uh, uh, pieces, these parts to construct a, uh, a space frame without welding uh, that could be assembled uh, to cover again, a, a variety of spans and also frame some of the existing buildings into other configurations. Uh, or uh, the, uh, what we ended up calling, inspired by Jean Prouvé, of course, I mean, there is nothing new about this, uh, the gutter beam that really will thread some existing uh, uh, constructions into uh, not only a structural spine, but also a place uh, to collect water and so on. And the one that we are trying to really enact uh, uh, at this moment is really this frame that comes precisely with the types of kit of parts of these elements to produce a sort of a scaffold that uh, in very simple ways stitches or helps to stitch that waste in more um, a, a, a comprehensive ways. So the linking of material resources and sweat equity is an important aspect here as these light frames then can become the kind of a scaffold, temporal scaffold, transitional infrastructural system that stitches many of those joys, many of those houses, many of those garage doors that are uh, uh, imported uh, you know, from San Diego. This temporal scaffold. Uh, somebody uh, mentioned at some point in one uh, presentation I gave, you know, who are you to say that these people want to live surrounded by trash? If you were to ask many of these people, they would say, I would love to live in San Diego in one of those Mac mansions. And, and I couldn't, you know, it was, I blew my mind. At the, but I, uh, quickly, I think, I, I thought uh, to answer, uh, well, yes, that's true, because I have, had asked, I have asked that question. But you tell me when that could happen. When, next year, five years from now, 10 years, in the next 50, what do we do in the meantime? And I think that that very cl uh, clear uh, premise, what do we do in the meantime, might suggest other purposes of infrastructural systems that are more agile in supporting transition, transformation, and change in this case, to visualize those transactions across public and private configurations, and to connect also, again, the rethinking of infrastructure through social organization, uh, the relationship of the formal and the physical, uh, uh, the, the physical and the social is at stake. So while waste flows is, is southbound, people go north in, church, in, in, in search for dollars. And I think even in the middle of this economic crisis, an unprecedented impact of immigration, uh, transforming in many ways uh, the very neighborhoods of Southern California. This has been the, 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 probably the most specific site of intervention of my practice, uh, the positive impact of immigrants in allowing us to reimagine existing urban policy. And so I've been collecting stories uh, in terms of narrativizing some of these uh, acts of retrofit, not only in Tijuana, but also an urbanism of adaptation in Southern California in the hands of many immigrants. And in so doing, I also have been thinking of uh, most of representation that are dynamic in, in, in nature that can talk about in very simple terms, again, once more, the, the complexity of this phenomena. So this is uh, what I called the non-conforming Buddha land use map, uh, which tells the story of a cross-border land use uh, condition to the north, the large chunks of land use from San Diego, right, in terms of this large subdivision of environments and uses, and to the south, where I already presented some evidence, the high pixelation of land use in Tijuana, and this, again, a more three-dimensional zoning. And I've been arguing that in the last years, this confetti 
of illegal uses and alternative adapt adapt uh, uh, systems of adaptation has begun to infiltrate itself into the largeness of Southern California. And when this confetti hits the ground, it begins to alter a variety of parcels uh, in located in many of those uh, remnant spaces of levy towns, the older neighborhoods, uh, the mid-city environments where immigrants are placing themselves. And there is uh, this uh, transformation or adaptation of these small parcels by what I would call these informal contingencies, these informal economies and densities uh, by immigrants that presents us with an amazing possibility. Can that be translated again in new uh, policy configurations? So these transformations are a, an interesting device uh, to document. But at the same time, we uh, are trying to locate the very specific agency of the actors behind these transformations, such as this uh, house that did, saved itself because it didn't go to Tijuana in exile, but in fact stayed in this environment, but was retrofitted uh, by uh, becoming a Buddhist temple. And in so doing, again, this Buddhist temple not only alters the parcel into other configurations, but also begins to negotiate resources with the community itself in terms of social, pedagogical, and cultural programming. So I'm interested in how these agencies play a role in, in fact, becoming the kinds of uh, translators of those informal entrepreneurial practices, but also in producing uh, conditions of exchange across uh, the neighborhood. I call this the neighborhood mandala, uh, in a sense. So rethinking density out of these uh, uh, stories. The fundamental uh, challenge of producing a new political language, because we have been perpetuating across academia, governance, and development, a very reductive equation about what density is. Density mere, uh, as a mere amount of things per acre, per area. In many of these examples, I think, which in fact perpetuate this recipe of an urbanism, of a levy town in steroids. Uh, in, many of, in many ways, it is in fact this uh, uh, kind of challenging of these reductive recipes what is at stake here, because in many of these neighborhoods, uh, density can be measured differently as an amount of social exchanges per area, as an amount of socioeconomic transactions per area, and whether the drama of those transactions can be specialized. I think this is something that uh, is uh, fundamental and of course has been part of our debate uh, as we as architects begin to be seduced once more with this fundamental kind of mutation of systems uh, and, and the kinds of transformations of the city can a space be temporalized or the temporalization of space. Um, this is the reason these border neighborhoods have been uh, for my practice a site of intervention but also to amplify that another conflict in our time is the conflict between consumption and production. I think that while we catapulted the global city in <coughs> our euphoria for the Dubais of the world, we only catapulted the notion of the global city as a site, as a privileged site of consumption and display, as architecture, in fact, took the role of camouflaging much of the, the kind of uh, inequality, but also the uh, backward uh, economic and political processes. Uh, what I'm interested in is in amplifying the city once more as a site of production, and in that sense, in that context, it is neighborhoods, marginal communities that have remained in, our, in the last years, sites of cultural and socioeconomic production. Uh, of course, uh, I'm talking about the very typical uh, kind of evolution in the last years of uh, glamorous economy of how many downtowns in the world benefited from uh, a tax increment based uh, uh, development, ma making these downtowns into uh, bubbles of wealth. Uh, and on the other end, what used to be the affordable sector for housing, which was the periphery, also the periphery in many American cities became inflated with an infrastructure and also recipes of privatization that made it also incredibly inaccessible. It is a space in the middle that has remained a challenge, the mid-cities. I was thinking about this the other day. Could it be that the new periphery is internal to the city? Of course, in these you know, environments, these older neighborhoods where many of these uh, diasporas from Latin America, Asia, and Africa settle, becoming conveniently the com service community to uh, service those wealthy downtowns and equally the wealthy periphery. So, because I live in California, uh, I'm jealous of all of you, uh, but uh, because I live in California next to Arizona, it's been essential, mainly in Arizona when amazing 
xenophobic anti-immigration policies has, have taken place to suggest that many of these transactions in the hands of immigrants to transform these environments could suggest a very different definition of citizenship, less conceived as a kind of protocol that enables somebody to have papers to belong to a nation state, but in fact suggests a, a citizenship as a creative act that enables the reorganization of institutional protocols and of course of spaces themselves. Uh, the kind of social contingency uh, of these transformations needs to be part of our imaginary as uh, devices. So I'm interested in an urbanization, particularly at this moment, beyond the property line, enabling different modalities of development. I'm interested, in fact, in becoming a developer of an alternative, if I can call it that, or a new performance. Performa is the spreadsheet of the developer. Uh, without gaining the knowledge uh, of those recipes, it's very difficult, I think, to advance uh, uh, our, uh, uh, these other uh, spaces to be mobilized. So the performa itself of the developer becomes a site of intervention, uh, because as you know, and I don't want to expand too much on this, but of course the developer manipulates time and resources in ways that maximize profit. And I think that there is embedded in those institutional protocols through lending and zoning interesting uh, pieces that need to be the devices uh, uh, for producing counter spatial and uh, socioeconomic uh, procedures. Can we inject into the rigidity and one dimensionality of this performance uh, the, the value of that informal economy uh, as two women associate themselves in renting a three-bedroom apartment, transforming into an illegal uh, uh, nursery and, and absorbed and represented by a nonprofit, can in fact uh, the value of invisible sweat equity uh, as uh, these, uh, these are all examples that we have gathered, of course, uh, from the kind of um, invisibility of these entrepreneurial, I, I can call them without, uh, uh, you know, being afraid of saying so, uh, energies embedded in these environments can then be translated and represented because they need to remain invisible, but they can really be uh, um, uh, articulated by these nonprofit organizations with which we have been collaborating. Can collaboration itself rethink the very nature of property uh, uh, as these different modalities or these actors are brought together. It's a longer story, but all I'm trying to say is that I've been trying to, some of the most specific work that I would hope to come someday again to share some of these as it uh, translates into, in fact, spatial uh, configurations, is how do we bundle? How do we uh, bring together this uh, energy uh, so that the performer is defined by bringing together two or three characters in the neighborhood who are already doing volunteering and producing economies at the domestic scale, how do we bring them together to form a, a kind of um, association? So we become as architects the facilitators of that representation in combination or collaboration with non-profit organizations and they are plugged into the pro forma as ways of rethinking, of course, uh, other types of funding that emerge from that possibility. So rethinking ownership in general is the point here. At this moment, essential, I think, to the discourse is to come up with other modalities of property. Uh, in a provocative way, I hope, uh, just like I proposed that the micro-basing in these informal settlements could be uh, the device to uh, imagine a neighborhood, equally I could say the economic pro forma could be an instrument to construct community. And I think that that's a challenge that we've been uh, trying to articulate in our relationship to uh, social systems, but also nonprofit organizations embedded in these neighborhoods who have the political and social power uh, to uh, connect these uh, possibilities again uh, to architecture. So we've been involved in projects in Hudson, New York, where some of these typologies respond to very particular uh, on the ground, non-profit, community-based organizations in, in, so that they become co-developers as well with communities uh, of these uh, uh, typologies. Uh, of course, the idea of small-scale development that has been prevented re in recent years by tax credit uh, subsidy-based structures is really at stake in our time. When, in fact, we cannot afford to build at large scales, this is a moment to, in fact, suggest that experimentation can happen at smaller scales and also amplify the role of these uh, communities to become co-developers of such projects. So in essence, my uh, practice has been interested in that very arduous process of transforming zoning and transforming economic performance from the observation of this pixelation and alteration uh, of uh, systems to the uh, ultimately 
uh, the production of new political and economic frameworks that then have special consequences uh, uh, in terms of architecture. Can we as architects, uh, in fact, uh, design besides buildings, design political and economic processes uh, that again recuperate or uh, rescue some of the concepts I was mentioning to you and gain the knowledge embedded in these institutions to make it really uh, uh, our own in, in in rethinking, of course, that gap between institutions and publics. I think there is a role for architects to become mediators and facilitators of uh, those uh, uh, possibilities, but not alone, and this is, of course, something that has been an issue, is that artists and architects want to rush to the solution, but I think we need to partner with others, and in that sense, it's been an important and very arduous process for me, in fact, to produce and design collaborations across uh, with non-profit organizations such as Casa Familiar in San Isidro, which has been the primary kind of emblematic project, even though we've been lucky to operate in other environments, but has been really the thesis in the last 10 years uh, as we have uh, uh, pushed the transformation of policy, of zoning in this, uh, in this uh, small neighborhood next to the checkpoint. Uh, so how to imagine the mediation between government and community Seemingly at a time when uh, you know, we have a seemingly progressive uh, administration, uh, can in fact uh, these nonprofit organizations uh, truly be, be amplified as mediators of top-down and bottom-up uh, politics and economics of growth? Uh, can we as architects design collaboration in this context, uh, linking the specialized knowledge of institutions with the creative and ethical knowledge of communities uh, in this exchange of knowledge, I think new platforms of uh, conceptualizing these agendas, I think, it, it, it begin to emerge. The translation of the informal itself becomes a project in collaboration with these nonprofit organizations, as I mentioned before, because they have the political and social knowledge. Not only that, they have the power of assembly, of convening. Uh, so the neighborhood as a political unit has been essential to the, uh, to the thinking here. Can we imagine uh, the designing of micro-political systems within those communities uh, that are also responding to these uh, alternative economic models, but that also embraced and framed by new social contracts? I'm very interested in the possibility that we also design the protocols, the interface that can assure and that can kind of um, articulate those relationships in poignant ways. So this is a micro-policy that we um, basically proposed to the city of San Diego a few years ago, which in fact, finally this June, we are pulling permits uh, for these two housing projects that we've been fighting for in the last years, and it's been an incredible process of evolution, uh, but the possibility of amplifying this nonprofit uh, as, a, again, a facilitator of the visualization of the invisible which might be problematic for many artists in the room, but I would love to uh, explain that later, uh, uh, the kind of mapping of encroachment, the proposition to the municipality of San Diego that this nonprofit would, in fact, put in the map all the illegal additions and all the illegal uh, economies that are plugged into the garages and the negotiation of boundaries between pr uh, properties to suggest a very particular neighborhood-based development zoning category. Uh, and that, of course, necessitated different modes of communication with the community. This is something essential here, the designing of tools that can mediate the debate, because we've been incredibly patronizing uh, 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 in terms of this uh, community-based design. Sometimes I'm categorized in terms of my work as community-based design, and I cannot be more at odds uh, with, in fact, uh, the, 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 the backward, at times, uh, procedures by which communities are engaged. I think we need to problematize the debate with many of these communities and really truly produce a process of uh, dissensus and disagreement and questioning of these recipes. So it's been, in essence, I, I would love to tell you the stories also about some of the games we've been designing and the, media and the artifacts to begin thinking about density differently with the community and fundamental stories about how the political language begins to emerge out of this conversation. This lady at some point called density neighborhood collaboration as she realized that that's what they were already doing. In one block, they were negotiating and sharing resources and spaces, but also fundamental to her definition, and she told me in Spanish, is that density could be about spaces, not objects. Can that be a kind of 
attitude. And, and so in this reframing of the, the conversation, the problematizing of these cliches uh, begin to emerge a different uh, set of tools. So the municipality authorizes a, a, a new uh, zoning code for this neighborhood that makes many of these illegal properties be on the map, but because many of these people are invisible, meaning they are illegal uh, immigrants, if I had to call it that way, uh, the need here was for political representation. This is something fundamental uh, to speak of. It's not only representation in terms of images, it's a social political representation. Who is standing for whom in this case? So the nonprofit takes the, that representation in terms of bundling some of these actors into one uh, process so that the municipality gives the nonprofit the leverage to become the negotiator and facilitator of construction permits for the additions that are, will be placed but also uh, uh, the facilitators of uh, new uh, lending practices, if I can call it that. In other words, at this very moment, affordable housing developers take advantage of nonprofits in neighborhoods like this just to qualify for tax credit based uh, 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 financing, uh, and they just you know, ignore these nonprofits. The, the partnerships are just symbolic. Uh, and of course, tax credit based development only benefits large-scale development. This is another part of my research in terms of historic patterns in this country because I re <coughs> realized uh, recently that it used to be in the history of this country that small neighborhoods were enabled out of small-scale development. In California, for example, 50s, 60s, 70s, duplexes, fourplexes, six-packs, six six-unit development. In other words, lending and zoning collaborated to support small-scale development enabling levels of sustainability at the scale of neighborhoods. But at some point, of course, the whole thing becomes inflated and unaccessible to that level of scale as developers began to consolidate parcels and only producing this gargantuan development that in some of these environments is completely inappropriate at this moment, because we're talking about transitional densities. We cannot go from a pancake all the way to a kind of Manhattanization of the world. So what I'm trying to say is that also the nonprofit uh, becomes the representative uh, of this, so the, a 50 unit tax cre uh, credit based financing, which only benefits a 50 unit building uh, uh, that it is prohibited in these neighborhoods, is dispersed into smaller pieces. In other words, all these additions become now affordable, even though in the code at this moment that's impossible. So the kind of uh, negotiation of this, breaking apart of the large into small, and the kind of distributed resources uh, through the neighborhood again, by enabling a new mode of political representation of the community. Of course, this is the little mandalas that for me have been essential because the architect becomes the kind of masochistic, uh, kind of uh, facilitator, right, a negotiator or, or enabler of some of these transinstitutional and agency uh, relationships. Of course, the political and its special consequence is uh, what is at stake uh, here to me because uh, I really believe that these are small parcels in many of these neighborhoods become micro socioeconomic systems, uh, just like the Buddhist temple. They are not just a static pedestal of a house, but they become, in fact, micro infrastructures that anticipate sociability and economy. So at the end of the day, many of these parcels that we are working in these neighborhoods are articulated as uh, examples of a kind of prototype of development that enables uh, the nonprofit organization that now has evolved from social service provider into a developer of affordable housing, conceiving the neighborhood as a producer of new housing policy and economy, designing parcels as a small infrastructures that mobilize entrepreneurship into new spaces of housing and cultural configurations. The nonprofit purchased a church recently uh, that we be became the kind of hinge for this uh, um, uh, project, and subsequently they uh, bought the parcels next door. Uh, again, very small parcels that become the laboratory for this uh, coexistence of different housing economies, the retrofitting of the church into a cultural incubator. I'm interested in this idea that we can incubate others, or like incub the neighborhood incubates a series of social and cultural relationships. The small uh, social rooms, as we call them, uh, equipped with electricity and collective kitchens, uh, become the micro infrastructure again with the church uh, to be injected with a specific cultural and economic programming. I'm interested in the conceptualization of smart programming that enables the interface between people, space, and program. Uh, so at some point, these environments become the sites for the many workshops, the urban pedagogical models that this nonprofit enables to raise an idea of civic culture in the neighborhood, or maybe frame the informal markets 
that move from the alleys to the parcels. All I'm trying to say is that the public now is distributed through private parcels in these environments where, in fact, a, a public infrastructure has been defunded and, and, and absent. Here, the void is, is more than just a, a space for adding more house. Uh, it is, in fact, the device uh, to rethink and, and, and activate uh, some of these informal economies and densities, but ultimately become the hinge mechanisms uh, to suggest that housing cannot uh, exist on its own. It needs to be plugged with economic and social uh, support systems. So the church, the social rooms, and the collective kitchens are the small infrastructure to be threaded by a variety of housing economies that coexist in this small parcel. So this one is a housing type uh, for young couples with single mothers with children. But the idea is that the residents of this particular typology uh, collaborate with a nonprofit in co-managing and co-producing the programs that are injected uh, through time in some of those environments. Or the duplex that is devoted to a couple of social practice artists uh, that are interested in using uh, people and community as environments to rethink these relationships. So social service is exchanged for rent, uh, but also the integration of their thinking as a kind of social contract. They are accountable for engaging uh, these uh, residents. So uh, uh, they also inject into these environments. So these are micro infrastructures of social service, really, that enable this activity to be uh, amplified. Art and community, urban pedagogical models, but there are spaces and infrastructures that really mobilize that. Uh, this is an important aspect in our time because many social practice artists have only taken community symbolically. They don't really enable the operative dimension of community, making these residents co-producers of some of those possibilities. And in the end of the small parcel, large units for families who live with grandmothers, sharing large kitchens, but in turn also a kind of social contract that links them to the nonprofit who are in the church to uh, also amplify uh, levels of entrepreneurship. Uh, the as assurances, the guarantees that really enable these people to be accompanied through the process. And finally, a small series of sheds. We found out in the San Diego Code that is a room is no lar larger than 12 by 10, 120 square feet. And if you put a utility sink and a large window, it could be a beautiful studio for an artist. That building does not need a permit. So this could be actually small sheds, a la Casujo Sejima in a way, uh, that in fact can be built by the community. So different economies of construction, different economies of housing catering to different types of composition socially, but curated and enabled by programs that uh, the nonprofit and others uh, co-produce uh, with the community. So density, again, no longer sustainable as an amount of objects per acre, but the possibility of redefining housing as a system of economic and cultural interactions. So again, that's the reason it's been important to amplify the meaning and the role of these small parcels uh, in these neighborhoods. Obviously, the need to think of housing differently, uh, not just as uh, housing units uh, in steroids, but the need to plug uh, support systems into housing so that for each of these space, spaces in these small pieces, there is a kind of social contract equally uh, designed. I'm interested, and there is no time today, I thought I would have time to talk about the stories of Medellin that have been, I have been working with in association with Alejandro Echeverry and some people in Medellin, and in fact mapping the political and socioeconomic processes behind the beautiful images that we see, because nobody knows how the hell they did it. And somehow there is something very interesting, what they do over there, that they, in, in parallel to the designing of spaces, they also design the management processes by which programming and economic support will sustain itself in the long term. Without that pairing, I think it's important to think uh, of sustainability. So obviously what I'm speaking is the redefinition of zoning less as a punitive tool to prevent socialization and more as a generative tool uh, that reorganizes uh, not only lending but economy uh, and sociability, essential to the reimagination of urban policy in our time and the small devices that can be injected with these temporal dynamics that anticipate uh, and choreograph these interactions. Somebody has to curate the interface. Uh, the moment when we have perpetuated the isolation of the individual and his or her uh, possibility of economic expansion. I think this, once more, the possibility of re-engaging a collective imagination at the scale of these small pieces, the threading of housing and infrastructure. What is interesting is that recently in California, uh, because of the uh, erasure of uh, uh, development agencies, uh, uh, redevelopment agencies, I don't know if you've heard about this, we lost a lot of funding 
uh, that was secured for these projects. And what was interesting is that the small scale of this project began to be uh, the device to remain agile enough to really rethink the performa, even without that support from the state. Uh, so the democratization of urban development uh, is at stake here. Uh, of course, the pixelation of those recipes into expanded uh, possibilities. And let me finish by two gestures very quickly, uh, because I'm not only interested in the small scale, which is, has been the device, of course, to rethink a top-down policy and economy, uh, so how do we move from the micro to the macro is an incredible challenge. This is a question that I always get. So how do you scale this up? Uh, but of course, uh, we are impatient. I mean, uh, uh, th this is about an incremental uh, urbanization that uh, uh, could, again, begin to suggest very different um, ideas about policy. So from the neighborhood to the region can, in fact, uh, the types of um, agendas embedded in these localities, these are the two neighborhoods that I've been working in the last years, uh, San Isidro to the north, you see faintly the border between Tijuana and San Diego, and in this canyon to the south, an informal settlement that is home to 85,000 people called the Laureles Canyon. It's a slum in Mexico that crashes against the border wall. It has been a, a recently a, the environment of work. Can we reimagine the region uh, through the kind of specificity of the political and the economic embedded in these transactions. So this is where the political equator e e e emerges, because I showed you the horizon of local conflict. I want to end by showing you a couple of uh, kind of gestures that begin to link the specificity uh, of this uh, juncture, this political juncture, Tijuana-San Diego as a border. When I discovered that Tijuana-San Diego uh, uh, occupying this sort of uh, th uh, space between the 33 to 20, 28 to 33 north degree uh, parallel is linked uh, to some of the most intensive checkpoints in the world, including, including Ceuta and Melilla, in the, me, being the main funnel of migration from North Africa into Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border, all the way to, of course, the transformations of even the Chinese metropoli out of urbanities of surveillance and control. So I'm thinking of how to catapult the specificity of the, of the local to rethink conditions of the global uh, is essential and to uh, maybe begin to reimagine uh, these conditions outside the nation state constructs, uh, but ultimately that the intelligence embedded in these communities can uh, really become the laboratory for rethinking a policy at that scale. Uh, I discovered that this political equator coincided with the Pentagon's new map after 9-11 that subdivides the worlds between what used to be the third and first worlds now between the non-integrating gap, which is the red area, the kind of dysfunctional families of the global south, from which unprecedented migration flows to the functioning core, where some of the strongest economies of the world are concentrated. Uh, and the functioning core also in the last years has decentered its uh, uh, sites of production, searching for the cheap labor markets of the global south. In the so these, again, transference, people in one direction, goods and services to the other are replicated uh, in this political equator, but became the device for a series of um, a, a environments. I'm interested in curating uh, the interface, but curating conversations. Uh, so I've discovered recently, of course, that not only the spring revolution is at the edges of this political equator, but in fact the climatic equator is embedded into it. It was uh, Bob Minister Fuller who years ago reminded us that any conversation at the scale of the global and transnational would begin by understanding that the future of the world depended on a triad, the kind of relationship or conflict across geopolitical borders, marginal communities, and natural resources. And it is that uh, kind of uh, relationship that begins to hopefully reframe our conversation today about the urgency to uh, produce new correspondences between global and local between top-down and bottom-up, of course, between formal and informal systems and ultimately jurisdictional and natural uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so this political equator uh, introduced me to the fact that these two neighborhoods that I've been working with in the last years are placed at the tip end of the Tijuana River watershed system. Uh, so this is the border that divides this watershed, imagine that. It truncated, 75% of it is in Mexico and the rest in the US, no collaboration in the management of these natural resources. The politics of water, pressing issue in Southern California, and as we begin to zoom in, you can see how the river enters into San Diego and ends in the Tijuana River estuary, which is that protected environmental zone that is overlaid with homeland security, and the two neighborhoods have been working with sandwich this uh, environment. So no other place, again, I could find the proximity of informal 
the proximity of militarization and environmental systems, right, a, a coexistence. So I produce a series of events uh, that would begin the conversation of the linkage of these communities that are so close to each other but divided, and uh, we produce a performance uh, uh, that would enable the crossing of the border in, uh, in, in unprecedented ways. Uh, we propose to Homeland Security and Mexican immigration to cross the border through a newly built drain between the shanty town of 85,000 people, the Homeland Security, and the Tijuana River estuary uh, that would be an alternative crossing to the official checkpoint. In other words, to transform the drain into an official port of entry into Mexico from the US during 24 hours. That was the key gesture of the, of the event. I'm interested in producing symposia that, not, that do not occupy the university, but takes publics and activists and different stakeholders in the conflict to the context itself of conflict, embedded in that, uh, the drama of those environments. So we produce that conversation right here in the, in the co collision of the favela and the estuary and homeland security in the middle. Uh, we call this a political equator three, and we wanted to amplify and visualize that the, uh, the flow of sediment and pollution from the shanty town was beginning to infiltrate into the estuary, contaminating it after the construction of the new walls. Uh, so it is, this is the debris uh, trickling in from the uh, uh, slum into, into, into San Diego, and we produced a series of devices to, in fact, uh, uh, amplify this conversation, to really visualize these environments. And we were here, in fact, in Homeland Security territory. We, had, we wanted to do this officially. So Homeland Security is enabling us to approach the wall and ultimately enable the crossing uh, uh, of the wall uh, through the drain in collaboration with uh, Mexican immigration who was waiting for us on the south end of the drain to stamp our passports. That was the whole uh, gesture in a sense, to make it an official crossing. Of course, uh, what is uh, really important about this story is that not only, again, bringing uh, the public uh, to a different level of imagination about really what has produced these collisions. Because most of American public would maybe be or not in favor at this moment of the construction of that border wall, but very few people know that for the sake of security we're building the wall, but at the same time we could argue that we are building a sense of insecurity because that wall is undermining the functionality of that watershed system, potentially producing in the future socioeconomic degradation. So it's this backward stupidity of institutions in injecting top down Again, these types of artifacts that do not take into account the codependence of these communities. That they, in fact, the slum, the informal settlement in Tijuana could be the protector of the estuary. That was a compelling provocation. And in order to cement and concretize this gesture to really suggest that we cross the border. So here we are in line, because it was an official, I'm crossing the border, this, I'm crossing the drain I'm between the US and Mexico. At this moment, Mexican immigration waiting for us at the other end. And as they stamp our passport, or my passport, uh, the sewer flowing from uh, the shanty town into the estuary. So this became a kind of performance. Many things can be hidden and camouflaged by art. This is a really, you know, and in a sense, enabling this collaboration. It took us a year to negotiate this permit, uh, uh, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that we could become, again, the curators of these complex interfaces to, again, end up visualizing, ultimately, this. And let me finish. Uh, uh, with the last uh, gesture, which is in fact a project that recently we completed in Korea, which we ended up calling Conversations on Coexistence. I wanted to end with projects that I've been interested in developing where we think that people are also material, that social relations can be uh, in fact a, a material for uh, these types of processes. So we were invited to come to Anyang, which is a, uh, a, city, a satellite city to Seoul, and when I'm with the uh, office of the mayor and and, and the curator of the project and this tower in this city, I look outside the window and I see these small houses uh, that look al actually like California, you know, these small bungalows spread through these mountains. But when I approached the, the window, they were just, you know, I realized that they were just the tip end uh, of these uh, uh, homogenized, I mean, these humongous vertical new uh, uh, suburbs, right? These, uh, the, what in California is a horizontal sprawl, in these countries uh, it is a vertical sprawl. So I realized that what I wanted to engage in this context was the conflict between the vertical and the horizontal, which continues to be unresolved by architecture in these environments. As we notice that governments, developers, and architects are demolishing older neighborhoods in many of these cities to impose this uh, homogenization of housing. So we decided to do a simple gesture to begin building models 
uh, of, this, of these neighborhoods that were going to be demolished. But building them uh, as mediating tools to generate a conversation across a variety of stakeholders in the politics and economics of development in Korea. I've been very interested in notions by Chantal Mouffe that suggest an agonistic model of intervention into public space where public space is amplified, in fact, as a kind of battleground where the hegemony of political and economic power is simply visualized. In other words, the intervention is in the debate itself and the artifacts that are uh, uh, enabling that conversation. So we went to the streets to build these models, not only with uh, school children, uh, but also with activists and other uh, university students uh, to produce these very, at times, simple visualizations that would uh, get a gener uh, in to generate a conversation uh, uh, across, again, these different environments. Um, and uh, ultimately, <laughs> in the measuring, in the kind of visualization of these environments, which was already a kind of luxury. We did not engage, unfortunately, architectural students because we didn't want bass wood models, uh, you know, abstractions. We wanted something very lyrical that could capture the specificity of detail of some of these environments and, of course, some of the kind of informal economies and densities that were essential to these neighborhoods, such as this man who, in fact, built a snail farm in four rooftops of this neighborhood. And also, he produced a kind of collective uh, or association that would manage the profits of some of these uh, uh, types of production. So again, the argument was, fine, we can accept that we need to densify, but why are we erasing uh, some of these uh, incredible instruments for sustainability for a neighborhood? The kind of value and the meaning of this entrepreneurial, once more, incredible informalities that produce sustainability at that scale. Uh, and the other one, um, uh, which is, uh, is, is uh, a small playground, let me uh, show you this one, but uh, it, it, we found amazing cases. I mean, they kind of, once more, a documentation of this. This one is about a playground that is inserted between two houses, an alley, and leftover space, and a, uh, a, a, an orchard. orchard? Uh, I mean, again, you all know that in Korea, in many of these cities, urban agriculture is alive and managed out of an incredible activist and associative fabric. Uh, so again, the, the value of these uh, conditions was being ignored uh, by many of, of these institutions. So we brought the models and the stories to the developers and the architects who probably went to Harvard uh, to study architecture, uh, or, uh, other, you know, or the developers in, con in combination with the municipality to really uh, talk about uh, the pros and cons, the type of um, uh, the kind of value, again, the hidden value of these uh, conditions, and, and including the Catholic Church, which in Korea is the epicenter uh, of the re resistance to these modes of development. Uh, again, the possibility of producing a new political language out of these transactions and negotiations, because we found out that even the activists were ignorant of, in fact, many of those hidden uh, types of uh, um, uh, processes uh, that, that, that they did not, at times, argue uh, for uh, in the sake for, of reaction, I think, uh, throwing the baby with the bathwater, we would say, uh, we were not really uh, enabling the articulation of a new political language, uh, a, a new set of uh, protocols uh, to, in fact, resist and alter those policies. This is a, a, a key qu a questioning of uh, uh, activist practices in our time that have, in fact, at times perpetuated only the kind of complaints about the problem, but very seldom we find, in fact, procedures that can enable the transgression of that problem. So the intervention into the debate itself is a, a, an issue that has been of interest to me, because at the end of this project, uh, we produced a Bill of Rights uh, that was emblematic, uh, that was presented officially, because we were invited as international artists to the mayor of the city, simple terms. If you read the second Bill of Rights of FDR, it's equally as powerful in its simplicity. The right to enable the coexistence of different economies of housing, in these neighborhoods, the right to develop incrementally at different speeds of growth, the right to share the profits of urbanization enabling local modes of production, uh, the right to retrofit itself, the neighborhood enabling small and inclusive development. Uh, and of course, for each of these rights, there would be a procedure that would be as tangible. So the operative dimension of participation uh, is uh, the, the, the possibility here. And uh, finally, something important uh, to my practice, uh, in, in being dissatisfied by the, the, the cliches that we tend to throw around, I think I, I propose that we need to move uh, uh, away from the neutrality of our ideas of the public, 
to the specificity of protocols. This is something that Opwi Ewensor, the curator, once told me. Uh, he reminded me that the civil rights movement uh, had begun in the United States in a bus. Uh, and if you really think about it, when that lady sat in that seat that she did not belong, that bus was public, but it was not, in fact, accessible to everyone. So we need to move from the abstraction that we primarily architects engage in terms of thinking of public space where we think just by enabling a place to be beautiful, all of a sudden, magically, people will appear, to the specificity of rights. In fact, that's the question in our time as we move from in, in the context of this crisis. Can we, as architects, be the designers of new protocols in this context? Can, in fact, the future of the city be a compelling possibility, but not only led by buildings, but really by the reconfiguration of socioeconomic relations, where, in fact, design has a role can we reconnect, ultimately, urban policy and the collective's imagination? I think that's the challenge in our time. Thank you very much. So, questions? Yes, I took too long, but I wanted to... But please, if there are a couple of questions. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks. I, I will apologize for missing the first uh, couple of minutes, um, probably because I just came from another conference in which uh, it's related because I'm going to ask you a very superficial question, but it, you may have answered it in those minutes. Um, I was just in another conference in which one of my favorite um, slogans was cited. Uh, I won't tell you the source, but the slogan is uh, this is kind of saying is that it's, it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine <laughs> the end of capitalism, um, which I think is a fact. And so I wanted to ask you about the use of the color red in your graphics and your drawings. It's sort of a pedagogical question with respect to the, you know, the students and the kind of strategies that we develop, and you've been very, very effective and creative in developing a kind of visual language by which to mobilize the forces that you're trying to mobilize. So you, in, in that language, you know, as, as is on the screen right now, you combine the color red with the color yellow, uh, which I take as a citation, particularly the red, that was manifest in the postcard, and I saw briefly the De Boer um, mm -hmm. Naked City drawing uh, kind of quoted. So for De Boer, for, for, for the people who made those drawings, red meant political partisanship, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, it kind of, so when, when one sees the, red, the color red with the word political, one historically makes these connections. And you, know, and, and you can test it by trying to imagine green arrows or something, or blue arrows, instead of the red ones. So I, just, I really just wanted to ask, what, in what sense you want us to read the red? OK. Um, first of all, I think this, this slogan that you're talking about, uh, depending on who says it, it has a different connotation. I think David Harvey might have suggested we, uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's Shishek, uh, Slavoj Shishek is the one who suggested, which is the one that I am compelled by, that it's, easy to, or it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine small alterations of capitalism, modest alterations of capitalism. I take that to be probably my slogan. Uh, in terms of uh, the problem with uh, the left in our time has been the aspiration of this ideal utopia that will not get to us that quickly, and what do we do in the meantime? I think that we need to locate much of this radicality into small alterations of the system, infiltrating uh, into those protocols. Uh, to t unfortunately, I wish I had a bit more dramatic explanation about the really simply a, a device to really produce a, a drama. Uh, in the, in the, con in, in the kind of I, compelling... Yes, yeah, so you understand, though, that I'm not accepting that, that, that the premise of quoting De Boer, I'm asking you a specific yes. historical question, quoting anarcho-communism, basically, which is very, very important. It's a very important project for Occupy Wall Street. It's, it's, another, it's a more serious question, obviously, in the, in the, mm -hmm. between the lines, um, is, is, does, not, is not, does not not signify. You see, that, that's, that's the point. It may be ambiguously... Mm meaningful, but it doesn't not signify. So, for example, for that political project, the, the translation, the sort of more local translation in, in, let's say, this kind of environment, 
would be the abolition of the real estate developer. Right, simply to abolish the whole, to, to propose the abolition of real estate development, right? Is there, is there room for such a thought, I guess, is what I'm asking, in the red that we're seeing on the screen? Well, you know, on one hand, I think uh, the image of the board, which I ended up calling the border, <laughs> because I thought for a moment uh, the, the possibility of stealing uh, some of these emblematic images that uh, were uh, emancipatory at some point, but they uh, trivialize themselves. I've been asking myself, where do we pick it up? Where, do, where did situationism end and where do we continue? Or where does, so in a sense, it's been a way of uh, kind of uh, retrofitting equally and appropriating these utopian uh, signifiers for a moment. So I thought that the border was a more interesting locality to speak of this urbanism of transgression at the scale of communities and neighborhoods instead of this top-down uh, view and so on. So there is a kind of intentionality in the way that these images become meaningful to me. Uh, and on the other, I think that ultimately is definitely, and maybe Michael Sorkin said it better, uh, you know, at a moment when we have been uh, um, uh, perpetuating these notions of sustainability as just another way of camouflaging the very politics and economics uh, uh, of growth in such uh, 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 ways, that we maybe need to sprinkle, uh, sprinkle the green with uh, Expand on this later. Yes. It says it's on. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question uh, based, uh, basically based on the first two minutes of your presentation. And you showed the sort of um, correlation between these two lines, which I thought was a very compelling way. To start, I mean, basically, you're saying that income inequality is is tied to um, tied to uh, to a t uh, the the tax uh, the the tax inequality essentially, um, and uh, and you you continuously uh, reference Roosevelt and his um, second Bill of Rights, and and one thing I'm I'm wondering is that uh, sort of your in in your sort of hero uh, your valorization of, of Roosevelt, this is a time when we see a, a totally robust nation state, right? Where um, tax revenues are very high, um, or, uh, or, t or actually spending is very high, rather. And, um, and we see uh, large infrastructural projects. And, and this is, of course, you're, you're proposing something very different from that. And what I'm wondering is, how is there any interest in actually interrupting this system because what what I can see is maybe the danger in this is that uh, every th business as usual um, is is not only uh, sort of um, allowed but is enabled um, you know we're doing more with less with less taxes on on the flip side I do see an incredible amount of opportunity in the sense that where, where, you, where you start talking about the neighborhood as a political unit um, and, uh, and, and you use the word social contract um, to describe it. And, and one thing that I'm seeing though is that when does this neighborhood as a political unit actually act politically? You know, when can they, uh, can, is, are you suggesting a sort of new sort of sovereignty? How does this operate mm -hmm. within the nation state? Mm -hmm. As okay, a, as a that's a more compelling question. I think that, and I will maybe share the other story in tandem with the one of uh, uh, the civil rights movement because I mentioned last night, you know, recently I went to Ramallah for this uh, conference 
and that was my first time in Palestine. And and as I was, some of the organizers took me around. I was completely surprised to find some new development developments by Palestinian developers next to this place where we were. And those housing developments were horrendous. You know, they were not only imposed on the hills, but what was so uh, uh, troubling is that they replicated, in fact, almost uh, uh, faithfully Israeli settlements uh, in their organization, in their uh, image and identity and so on. And I began to think, because I was in conversation with some friends of mine who, you know, decolonizing architecture with Eyal and Alessandro, so, who have been talking or uh, enabling a research really at the scale, of course, the nation state, or at least at the scale of sovereignty as a condition. And be, I kind of, it dawned on me at that moment, I said, could we speak at, about sovereignty uh, by in fact resolving uh, 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 the kind of pro forma of, of, again, of a housing project. In other words, I came to Palestine thinking that I was going to find incredible activism uh, in the kinds of uh, the spatialization of some of this activism in housing models that could resonate uh, the aspirations of a community uh, for self-affirmation and emancipation in a sense. And what I found was this again, the, 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 so the, the answer that is, it is in fact the bottom line uh, profit driven performance that uh, really were winning the case in this context. So in essence, I began to realize as a kind of way of uh, legitimizing my uh, research for a moment, uh, that a community will not be free in this context until it resolves its housing paradigms until it resolves its uh, idiosyncratic, at times, conditions of infrastructure and uh, political and social organization. And that's what I mean about the poli the, pol the political is already embedded in these communities, but we've ignored them as artists in framing that uh, uh, to produce, at least as an architecture, uh, other modes of specialization. It's important to say this because I think that many artists and we tend to hide behind the mission of producing political art and as Tania Bruguera once told me, I'm more interested in constructing the political. And this is what some of these agencies, some of these uh, actors in these environments have been doing out of, again, their own uh, praxis. So that's what I would say, yes, I, uh, I think that is about a different idea of sovereignty uh, at the scale of these small gestures that can articulate different modes of development. That, that's uh, essential. And, uh, and of course, the issue of, I disagree with you about, I mean, Co uh, public spending cuts, uh, the defunding of public education, the defunding of public infrastructure is really the paradigm at this moment. That's the reason I said that's what is different about the post-crisis in this country as opposed to after the depression. That before there was a political will to not only reform the institutions and to really uh, produce a different public imagination. And that's the reason I refer to some of those policies of that time. Uh, ours is right now a debate about detaxing about, in fact, a, 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 a crumpling, the kind of leverage that would enable us to invest in an infrastructure as a tool to regenerate an economy and beyond. So I think I cannot believe how backward, really, ultimately, uh, the, the system is at this moment that we continue to be locked into this debate, right? That we think that by detaxing uh, ourselves, we're going to uh, ultimately, uh, you know, produce the kind of models that, that we imagine. I just wanted to finish with this question because I again back to Medellin very quickly. I was recently ready to go up on one of those uh, gondolas of the um, <coughs> cable cars going to the library parks that we've seen published all over the place. And as I'm going up, I see to my right a little hill uh, that was not invaded by the city. It was uh, still pristine. And I asked my guide, what is that? If that was in Guatemala, that would have been already invaded by, you know, uh, uh, shanties or whatever. And he said, oh, no, that's, you know, that, that's uh, the, the remnant or the, the kind of legacy of this uh, philanthropist called uh, Ricardo Olano, who uh, in the 20s traveled to the United States and went to Boston, fell enamored with Olmsted, fell enamored with the United States as they were investing in public infrastructure, as they were thinking of natural ecologies and systems to be devices to frame the city. And he came back to Medellin to found uh, Mejoras Públicas of Medellín, which is an institution that then yielded the institutions that now are, reproduce, are producing this amazing progressive system. So in other words, it used to be that this country was the example uh, in producing different institutional synergies about this political will to invest in the public. And that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's not a progressive taxation, political will to engage public imagination is really at stake at this moment. 
sort of obvious why um, Teddy was the right guy to be here tonight. Um, he, when he turns 50, uh, in his 50, he's going to become passionate. Um, he's going to have lots of ideas. He's been a quiet guy for a long time. Uh, it's about to change. It was really great, Teddy. Thank you. Thank you.